And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus perceived in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and he said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Today we begin a brand new series called Vitality. The series is geared towards our mission and our vision as a church. You know, for some of us that are here today, this is part of who you are. This is part of your life. Vital Point Church is home. My prayer for you in this series, Vitality, is that this series will reignite your passion or it will increase your passion of what God is doing in and through you and in and through Vital Point Church. For some of you, I know that Vital Point Church is new. Maybe you've been around the last few months or maybe you've been checking it out. My prayer is, is that this will give you clarity as we unpack the next four weeks to give you clarity on our vision, mission, and who we are as a church. Now, for some of us, maybe you're a little bit new to church. Some of you maybe have never gone to church before or it's been a very long time since you've been in church. Here's what I hope it happens for you is that as we walk through this Vitality series, you will get a picture of Jesus that you will learn more about the heartbeat of Jesus through the heartbeat of this church. I'm excited about you starting out your journey, hearing about who we are as a church, because it will give you clarity and understanding, hopefully, as to who we are and what we're about. Now, being a multi-site church with multiple locations, this series is also designed to bring alignment in our sites. Sometimes we can get a little wobbly or we can get off track with our particular sites. But yet, in this series, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, for four weeks, unpack the vision and mission so that we, together, are on the same page. See, one of the things that I hope happens for all of us is that we will lean in more when the, as this series goes along. But here's what I also want to say. For some of you, maybe you've come into Vital Point from another church. Maybe your experience is a little bit different. My prayer is is that you will learn what Vital Point Church is about, and maybe you will decide, yes, this is for me. Or maybe at the end you will go, this isn't for me, and I want you to know that's okay because there are a lot of great churches in the regions we're in, and maybe one of those church would fit better for who you are and what you believe the church is to be. So let me right up front, give us the mission, vision, and kingdom assignment for us as a church. So the mission, what is our mission? Well, our mission is clear, to reach people who and walk with them as they become fully devoted followers of Jesus, or you could say fully developing followers of Jesus. Two things Jesus said when he was preparing to leave his people and ascend back to the right hand of the Father, God his Father is he said this, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. He has actually commissioned us. It is our mission to go with the expansive message, expanding and expansive message of Jesus Christ and the good news. But he also said this in Acts chapter one, verse eight, he says, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, starting in Jerusalem and then working its way out. See, when we look at the mission that God has given to us through Jesus Christ and his very own words captured for us in the Bible, we recognize that the mission is not an option. We are actually given this mission from Jesus and we are to follow it. Now, how we express that is through the vision that vision statement that God has been unfolding for us as a church. The vision statement is this to be a multi-site church that reaches thousands of people who are exploring and growing in their knowledge of Jesus and commitment to his church. See, 
our approach to reaching as many people as possible, fulfilling the mission that Jesus has given to us, is to start Vital Point Church sites in small towns. And in doing so, we're creating spaces for people to have better access to the good news of Jesus Christ through our Vital Point sites in small towns. We want people to encounter the power of the resurrected Jesus, to point people to him and to, and because to point people to him is our deep conviction because we believe, and it's from the scriptures, from the Bible, is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So our kingdom assignment, very simply put, is to plant vibrant VPC sites in small towns. So you've got the mission, you've got the vision, and the kingdom assignment is our unique call as a church. When Jesus walked on this earth, he spent the vast majority of his time roaming around the region of Galilee. And what we need to know about that is that the region of Galilee was made up of about 200 small towns or so, which means this, Jesus loves small towns. And we recognize that Jesus is once again walking through small towns and he's inviting us to follow him. Now, let me be clear. This is not at the neglect of cities. Some of you listening to this or watching this and experiencing this are actually like, whoa, whoa, what about the cities, right? Because some of us are from there. Here's what I'm convinced about that is that yes, Jesus loves the city as well. He would eventually find himself in the city of Jerusalem and hanging on a cross and dying for our sins and resurrecting from the dead. But I would say this, is that Jesus is walking on your street again, and he's inviting you into the mission and the vision of reaching people with the greatest message in the world. See, the kingdom assignment is clear for us. When a church doesn't understand its kingdom assignment, it will very quickly become a Sunday morning social gathering where a few members put in pew time and then have a few potluck gatherings to serve its members. And you need to know, this is not us. Not that I'm against potlucks, because we all love a good potluck and good food, but we recognize that's not who we are. See, this kingdom assignment was birthed out of our faith obedience to the call of God on our lives. It wasn't clear at the beginning of, of Vital Point Church in 2014. It wasn't clear to us, but here's what I believe. As we take obedient steps of faith, the picture gets clearer for us each time we take a step. I believe that if God actually revealed to us the full picture from the very beginning, we would have all gone, this is impossible. But yet each step of the obedience and faith, we see the reality of this kingdom assignment and this vision and mission coming together to express in such a beautiful way. I came across this amazing quote for us. It's in a book that I've been reading, uh, Living Fearless. It says this about vision. Vision without action is merely a dream. Action without vision just passes the time. Vision with action can change the world. And you know what? We've seen this over the past few years as a church. Our vision is not simply just a phrase that we put up on a screen or we put on our website or we post on our social medias or we put, put on walls or posters or whatever it is. Our vision is becoming a reality because we have the actions that go with it and we're seeing the reality of change lives. Maybe not the change world, although you know you never know what God's gonna do with that, but what we see is the expansive good news of Jesus Christ being experienced as we go in faith. See, the vision becomes a reality when we as the church step in faithful obedience to the unique kingdom assignment that he's given to us. We have a deep conviction as a church. I want you to know this as clear as possible. We have a deep conviction as a church that VPC has been tasked with the responsibility of creating spaces and communities that walk to, in the heartbeat of Jesus Christ, living under his authority so that other people can get to experience him. That is the clarity that we're looking for over the course of the next few weeks. Now, 
many of you have heard the statements before. Many of you have actually heard this, and you're kind of like, Ron, I know this. But here's the thing. The moment that I start getting bored of saying these things is the moment you probably start getting them. So we're going to continue to keep going after the vision, mission, and our kingdom assignment to make sure we're all clear. Now, the series, we're going to take different pieces of the vision statement, and we're gonna unpack them. And to mess with us, you need to know that we're not actually going to do it in order. We're gonna mess up the order just a little bit because today I wanna begin our first vision vitality talk about faith with this statement. Here it is. The statement is exploring and growing in the knowledge of Jesus. That's in our vision statement. I hope that you'll have, by the end of four weeks, you'll have the vision statement memorized, but this is the part I wanna look at today, exploring and growing in the knowledge of Jesus. Now, as I think about that part, I think about a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in Philippi. Now, what you need to know about this, it's very fascinating, is that the Apostle Paul was a prominent church planter slash leader in the early church. God had tapped him for these uh, responsibilities and these assignments. And what he would do is he would often write letters to these churches and he would bring encouragement. He would bring uh, a, a challenge or correction as to what does it mean to be the church and what does it actually mean to be a follower of Jesus. And some of these letters, like this one uh, called Philippians, was written while he was under church uh, sorry, under house arrest, in prison. So he would take these letters and he would distribute them to these churches. Now this letter here, he's writing to the church at Philippi and he wants them to understand some important things. What I love about these letters, and there's an aspect of this that is important that you understand, is that the letters are written to a, at a, to a specific people at a specific time. But yet the beauty of the Bible being alive and active is that it has direct impact on us today. So when we read these letters, we go, okay, how does this actually fit into us today? This is the beauty of the scriptures written for a specific people at a specific time, but it's not trapped in time. It actually has relevance for us today. And I want to take you to the first little section of Paul's writing to the church of Philippi, and you we're going to get a picture of his heartbeat through the prayer that he had for them that connects directly to explore and grow in our knowledge of Jesus. Let me read it for you. It starts uh, verse five, uh, sorry, verse nine of chapter one. I'm so excited. I, my head's, my brain's spinning so fast. I, I'm, I can't keep up with everything in my head. So let me just slow down so that we're all on pace here. So Philippians 1, 9, 10, and 11. Ready? And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Right away, we see how Paul has a heart for the, for the people, for the people at Philippi, the church at Philippi. He has a heart for them and his heart is revealed by how he opens up the first part of the prayer. He says that he prays that their love may abound more and more. He says this because he understands that in order for the church to produce fruit, in order for the church to grow within its own community of faith, it has to be in good soil. And the soil is the abounding of the more and more love that he's speaking about here. Now, the word love is the, in the original is agape. It's this, this word that's used to express love between human beings. And, and, and some theologians believe that he's actually even referring also to our love for God. So when he says abound more and more signifies this, it signifies a continuous and increasing growth or expression in the depth of quality of love with two particular characteristics, which is knowledge and discernment or knowledge and insight. See, Paul wishes that their love for one another and God would continually deepen and mature and gain understanding of God's will and God's purpose. This growth and the love that he's talking about is profound and practical in expression, and it gives us the ability to discern 
as the knowledge increases of how to apply the love in the context in which they, in the culture in which they're living. They're in a culture where the Christian message is not well received. It has been pushed to the fringe. It's not even got even any close to the center of culture. It is at the fringe of culture. And so he's saying that your love may abound so that, your, so that the knowledge and discernment will increase. Why? Why does he say this? Because when love is growing and abounding, it reshapes our minds. And when our minds are reshaped, then we begin to understand and have clarity and see things through the lens of God's love. See, he wants them not just to show love, he actually wants them to live in the state of the love that God has for them and then for each other, and it abounds and abounds more and more. Now, think about the vision statement. When we grow in knowledge of Jesus, we begin to love him more deeply. And when we love him more deeply, the overflow transforms how we see the world around us. It literally reshapes the value we place on others because the value is through the lens of the love that is abounding more and more inside of us. Let me unpack this to kind of give some clarity, help you understand this as it connects to our vision statement. The church, some of you are aware of this, the church is not the buildings that we meet in. Our three locations meet in buildings. Matter of fact, uh, our Poplar Hill site, our Poplar Hill location, we don't even call it the church building. We call it the main building. We don't call it the church. We call it the main building. We have an office space and we have a main building. The church is not the buildings. The church is the people. And matter of fact, Paul, in his letter that he wrote to the churches to the church at Ephesus, even refers to the church as being the body of Christ. Look what it says in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. See, we have to understand that as we can link all this together is that the church is not something I go to. The church is something I become part of. We'll unpack that again later in the series. But we must understand we become part of it. See, when we think about this truth, what we need to connect to is that the abounding love overflows in people's lives within the context of the body of Christ, and then people get to see Jesus' love, but even more important, and this is an important aspect of it, they they don't even, not only just see it, people get to encounter Jesus as the love abounds more and more in the context of the people of God. When we as a church expand our love, I mean deep love, not the fake love that the world is trying to convince us of. This is a, it's under an exegesis on the love of our culture for just a second. The love that the world is peddling to us right now is shallow and weak. It's shallow and weak. Why? Because it's based on conformity, fear, and manipulation. Ever hear this phrase? If you don't love me, then you must hate me. What they're trying to say in the context of redefining love within our culture is that love is affirming and agreeing and aligning with everything that I do. And if you don't, then you must hate. No, that is not the biblical understanding of love. It's not that manipulation or fear of conformity. See, if we love according to the culture's idea of love, then people won't see Jesus and they won't encounter Jesus. They'll see a fake aspect of the love. The love that Paul's talking about here is a growing love that gets beyond the surface and sees the value of human beings. That's the knowledge and the discernment of seeing the value. See, God values human beings. He values them so much, he was willing to die on a cross. Jesus died on the cross, why? Because of the value that he sees in human beings and the deep, deep love that compelled him to go and to do something about our brokenness and our sin that separates us from God. He was willing to lay down his life for us. See, when we abound in the love through the knowledge of Jesus, 
what happens is we begin to be the church Jesus intended us to be. And here's the results. The result is the tasty fruit of righteousness. Oh yeah. Look at verse 11. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. The fruit of righteousness refers to the positive results or outcome that come from living a righteous life before God, a morally upright life before God, saturated in love. That's what he refers to earlier in verse 10, the pure and blameless life that we are to live before God. It signifies the visible and tangible evidence of faith communities, faith communities and their obedience to God's truth. And this is the fruit that is produced through Jesus in us and through us. I want you to think about it like this. The closer we as a church walk with Jesus, the more we look like Jesus. The closer we walk to Jesus, the more we look like Jesus we begin to take on the qualities of Jesus. And what are those qualities? What is the fruit of righteousness expressed that he talks about? Paul writes about it. Love, joy, peace, patience, uh, uh, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, kindness, and self-control. I almost forgot what they were. I had to look down. Um, These are the expressions of the power of this that we're talking about. Now, before you interpret all this, through the, you know, your, your worldview, you need to understand something about Vital Point Church when it comes to what we're talking about. Uh, you need to know that we hold a very high bar of speaking truth to one another. We really do. We do at times have to bring correction and clarity, not based on our own personal opinions, but based on what the Bible teaches us and how we are to live in the, under the authority of the scriptures that God has given to us. This is God's truth for us. We have to place ourselves under its authority. So it means at times we do have to speak truth. We do have to give clarity. We do have to challenge. I wanna say this. Vital Point is not a flaky cream puff culture that only preaches the, fl- the fluffy stuff to get a crowd. <laughs> Let me say it again. I wrote down, say it twice. This is not a flaky cream puff culture that only preaches the fully, uh, the fully, <laughs> the fluffy. St- we could cut this out, but I think, are we going to leave this in? We're going to leave this in because it's me making a big mistake. Preaches the fluffy stuff to get a crowd. <laughs> I don't know. What you will discover is that we do at times speak truth to each other, but you need to know, you need to know it will never ever come from a place of shame, guilt, and condemnation. Never. We hold up this picture of what Jesus has called us to, to a life of holiness and purity and blameless and this, and this, uh, this fruit of righteousness. We hold up that picture and say, this is the freedom that you're searching for. This is the message that Jesus has for you. I don't know about you, but I, I never want to change my life when someone comes into my life and is like pointing a finger at me and condemning me and judging me and shaming me and guilting me. That never brings transformation. That just brings manipulation and conformity. But we actually believe it through the picture that Jesus gives us. And the fruit of righteousness brings transformation. I want to share a story with you. Um, I've shared this story before, and I I want to share it again. Um, So I'm going to share this story, but I need you to know that uh, I don't always get this right, okay? So be aware of that. Kind of couch the story in that. Many years ago, I had finished preaching on the stage of a church that I used to be on staff at. I had finished preaching and I came down off the stage and I was at, after the service and a mom and a daughter came to talk to me, a young teenage daughter. And the teenage daughter had gotten pregnant and she was planning to have an abortion. And so what we did was we sat on the very stage that I had just finished preaching on. And I sat and I listened. I asked questions. I can't recall the entire conversation but I do remember at the end of the conversation, I just sat and I prayed with her. I never knew what had happened. I never got the rest of the story. A number of years later, 
12 years later, while being the pastor of Vital Point Church, I had finished preaching on the stage at the high school that we met in. This teenager, now a young woman, and her mom came down to introduce me to the young girl's son. See, I didn't condemn her, shame her. I wanted her to know the love of Jesus that he had for her. And even though she was thinking about making this decision, I knew that I had to live in the, uh, the abundance of the love that was growing inside of me. Now, keep in mind, please keep in mind, I don't always get that right. But I believe that what she experienced was the fruit of righteousness grounded in the love that I had for her. Paul prays over the church, and I believe he prays that for us. Think back for a moment with me. Think back for a moment for me the, the, the passage that was read from Mark chapter five. I want you to think about that, that woman who for 12 years had been searching and trying to find answers and overwhelmed, broke everything that she had. Nobody could solve the problem that she faced for 12 years. She was an outcast. Nobody wanted to touch her. Nobody wanted to be around her. She was, wasn't invited to family get-togethers because she was unclean. But something inside of her, something deep down inside of her compelled her to launch forward through the crowd and touch the garment of Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus turns to her. He turns to her and speaks to her. Look what it says. He perceived in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about the crowd and said, who touched my garments? He's aware that something had happened to him, that power had gone out. The crowd had pressed in and who touched me? And the disciples interact. And he looked around, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed from your disease. Jesus perceives, he knows, he sees, he creates this moment for her. He could have condemned her, he could have shamed her, but no, he created an environment for her to hear his voice. He calls her daughter. She gets a new identity. Go in peace, your faith has made you well. He restores her publicly in front of everybody and she lives into that moment. Jesus created a moment for her to experience his love for her. He gave room for her. See, the vision is to reach thousands of people, thousands, but here's what I want you to know. It's one story at a time, one person at a time, but it takes us as a community to be willing to create the space for people to touch the garment of Jesus. They can see him, that they can encounter him when they come to our environments and within our context. Last week in Poplar Hill, we had a sharing time and I loved hearing the reports of even one person who was shared and broken in our community as Vital Point Church responded in grace, creating a space for her. Powerful. A few weeks ago in Poplar Hill when I was speaking, I got to a point in the message where I, I said twice in the course of a few minutes, I'm not interested in playing church. And you need to know that came out of me and I'm not even sure why. Uh, these things happen sometimes. I'm not even sure why. I don't even, sometimes I don't even know what that means. But as I reflected on that moment and have been studying for our vision series called Vitality, is that I have a deep conviction, conviction as to what it means. It means this, that I want Vital Point Church to be a church that abounds in love more and more so that when we gather, those who have not yet encountered the healer will have the opportunity to touch his garment. See, when we gather, I just don't want it to be about great worship. 
I, 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 I mean, our bands are great across the board. I am so incredibly grateful for our creative musicians and the, and the community that creates the, these, they're starting to write songs and they lead these worships. And I'm like, wow, oh, this is so good and so amazing. But it's not just about great worship. It's not just about getting a break from your kids for an hour and VPC kids or Tuesday night, get your students out Tuesday night, people to the VPC students. You wanna make a priority of that. And it's not just memorable moments in talks where maybe you shed a tear or you laughed a little bit or you got some goosebumps. It's actually about making sure that we're growing in our knowledge of Jesus. Why? So that our love may abound more and more and so that people can see who Jesus is and that they can have their sins forgiven, that they can come out of the darkness into the light of Jesus Christ and find new life in him. Listen, if you are from another church, let me just speak to you for just a moment. This vision, this mission, this kingdom assignment is clear. And if you're coming into our environment, into our context, and you have ideas about what the church should be, you need to know that we're probably not gonna get on the next bandwagon to speak out against the government or rail against the system or march against the evils of the world. There's other people that are doing those things and they feel it's their call in their lives. That's fine, it's for them but it's not us. What we wanna do is inspire you to begin to live in relationship with Jesus Christ and be able to invite your friends who don't know Jesus into an environment where they'll meet Jesus because our love is abounding more and more. How beautiful is that? that you can be part of this. And listen, if it doesn't fit you, that's okay. We've lost lots of people that go, I'm not into this vision, I'm out of here. That's okay. I've been praying that all of us will either deepen the roots of our faith in the context of understanding the vision and mission and kingdom assignment, or we say, I just can't do this and I'm okay with that. I've been praying that God would would um, kind of prune our church a little bit so that we can continue to move forward because maybe you just can't go where we're going. I have a deep conviction, and this I'll end. My conviction is this, that Jesus is once again supernaturally moving across Canada. I get this from reading the scriptures and I get this from other people who are very aware of how these things are working in Canada. And I believe that Jesus is supernaturally once again healing people and giving them a taste of who he is, and then in the midst, understand that they need a savior. This woman caught, uh, this woman in, in Mark 5, she went through the crowd. She didn't need, know that she needed her sins forgiven. She wanted to be healed. And when she was healed, she discovered that Jesus is actually who he said he was, and that she began to understand him as the savior. This is what I am convinced of, again, is that Jesus is supernaturally healing people by his spirit to give God the praise and the glory, because at the end of Philippians 1, verse 11, he said, all praise and glory to God in the midst of all this. So what will it be? What will it be for us? Will you decide today to grow in your knowledge of Jesus? Will you learn the ways of Jesus and love him more deeply so that you can love others more deeply? Will you enter into the rental process of having your love abound more and more? I know it won't be easy, but together we find strength and the unity across the board as people begin to touch his garment, experience his garment, and maybe today, just maybe today, you need to have a touch of his garment as well. This is the who we are and why we exist as a church. This is who we are.